I know there are a lot of resources out there that instruct people on how to publish zines, but we are talking specifically about mini comics here. So I am going to try to give you some tips that I figured out while creating mini comics over the past 10 years. Whenever I get excited about comics these days, it's usually about mini comics. I may be excited about discovering a new cartoonist that I've never seen before, but often it's the presentation of the comic that I'm being impressed by. The world of mini comics is so special because it's about an artist creating the entire object. It's not only about the cartoonist's work, but also the entire presentation of the work. The best mini comics in my collection are the ones that would not be the same when presented in any other format. Therefore, I encourage people to think about the presentation of the entire book and not just about the comics within. Ed, that is the opening of the reproduction guide that Jordan Crane published online. I'm not even sure when it was published. I found it in about the year 2000, whenever I was working in a cubicle and making mini comics. And this has been like a Bible to me. I still do many of the things that I learned from this book or from the PDF originally. I still do them today from scanning artwork and preparing artwork to thinking about the entire project and the entire presentation of the book. And it comes from a bunch of sort of DIY mini comic artists, uh, kind of rebel artists who were making comics that at the time were very forward thinking and not like everything else I had seen. And this just captured my imagination to the point that I took the PDF and I made myself a zine so I could uh, could have it in real life. They would appreciate this. <laughs> well, hopefully. You did this. <laughs> so this is the cover. Again, this is all based on the PDF. Uh, the only thing I could take credit for is, is using like this weird chipboardy kind of cover. Um, I was working in a cubicle at the time as a graphic designer, had my own laser printer. And so like this paper probably came wrapped around something. I would claim like all this paper, you know, and I'd flatten it out and I would cut it and I would run it through my laser printer. <laughs> it was amazing the stuff that I would make, uh, you know, in this little cube. And so this is just an example of, of one of those mini comics. I would make a few things like this along the way and experiment with what I could actually print on. Um, but this is one of my favorite things I actually made while in that cube. And, uh, and you can see the contributors here, Ron Rigi Jr., Dave Cho, Brian Ralph, and Jordan Crane. This is a group at the time that I would associate with High Water Books. And it actually says here, and being a public service of High Water Books and Red Ink. This is one of those super generous documents, publications, where it's a how-to guide and a very practical how-to guide that anybody that's making their own comics could use. I'm so grateful for people that would do this kind of stuff because, again, really helped me. Um, so it's a primer on xerography, silk screening, and offset printing. Basically everything that right. I use, you know, for print production. So the way the, the zine is set up, the way the PDF is set up, is uh, each of these artists will go through and talk about, like, one, one type of production, one that they're familiar with, one that they use a lot. This first part is Xerography by Ron Rigi Jr. Uh, around this time, he was producing work that looked like this. This is Skibber Be By, published by High Water Books, probably late 90s, early 2000s. Again, I would have found it in the early 2000s. He's a, he's a fascinating artist. As you can see, like these are not comics that look like other comics. Right. He's doing, He's bringing a very different visual approach to the work itself. Um, and his stuff gets kind of more and more in this direction of like flat shapes, motifs, symbols, um, iconography, just just really blurring the lines, say, between typography, uh, like a realistic representational drawing, and then like symbols and things. And it really creates a unique experience. He's gone on to be published by companies like Fanographics and Drawn in Quarterly and is a fairly prolific cartoonist. You can find lots of his work in different examples. I brought this one along. This is uh, Diana. It's actually, I guess, like a fan a fan comic or a bootleg comic of uh, early Wonder Woman comics. And the reason I bring this is because it's photocopied. And his article is about photocopying and how to get the most out of the photocopies to make a nice mini comic. And I think this is a great example of that because you see he's photocopying onto pink paper. Right. A nice touch. 
photocopying onto like uh, and then trimming so that your book is a different size you know it's not a standard size it's kind of an interesting object yeah and it, and it creates a full bleed effect so it makes it look like a two color print job yeah it's a very very uh professional satisfying and and piece and so when he talks about you know thinking of this as an object that's what you're seeing on display uh, in this particular comic and really in all of his comics, which range from mini comics to big hardcover, graphic novel, art book-like pieces. But I think this philosophy of thinking of the whole book, um, I think he applies it to everything he does. So this is great, and it goes through talking about some of the different copying services, you know, uh, one color, full color, uh, preparing artwork, just very practical information large volume copiers, you know, there, there's a lot of different stuff that was going on at the time. One of them is index colors, and this was photocopy machines that you could put, like, a, uh, a color in. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't full color, but it might be, like, a photocopy, but it's it's blue or red is a color that you could produce. Almost like, uh, you know, it'd be like black and white. It's just you're replacing the black with one of these, like, different color toners. Um, those weren't around very long. I've seen a few people. I, I know some people that did this. I think Bill Boyshell had yeah. a machine like that and produced some stuff like that, I believe. Yeah, he's a guy who comes to mind. But they did not last very long. And, and now I think if you want to do it now, like a risograph machine might be something that's sort of along the same lines. It's different, but it's, you know, that one color printing process, except not just limited to black ink. Yeah, it's interesting that risograph is the old technology, but it's not mentioned here. Yeah, it, it is funny. You know, th those machines have become so prominent in mini comics making, and they just weren't, I don't know, nobody was doing it in, you know, in 2000 or in the late 90s, whenever this came out. But he covers things like collating, cutting, binding, which we show in that Diana comic, that idea of by cutting, you can create a full bleed effect. So uh, a lot of the information here, again, being applied throughout his career in the decades since. One of the most amazing things to me in going through this reproduction guide this thing is this is a 20 plus year old document it all it all almost all of it still is true yeah yeah like especially when it comes to the scanning um technology hasn't changed it's like it's like it's like the steering wheels where it is and has been the way it was for a reason and you know 300 dpi color um 1200 dpi bitmap like like all those standards are still the same it, it's it's not like 4k 8k tv Right. where things get higher and higher res, it's like, it's good enough. And of course, um, Xerox is sort of the staple of zine production and things, uh, you know, from the 80s, whenever it became very accessible, especially places like, uh, you know, Kinko's or somewhere where you could really access them for a relatively low amount of money. So there's two articles in here about Xerox. And this one is by David Cho. Uh, Slow Jams is one of the comics that he made. A lot of his comics would be like anthology contributions here and there, but Slow Jams was something that he got a, um, a Zeric Award for, and it has all kinds of stuff in it. You know, this is far from photocopied, but to give you a sense of where he's coming from and see some of his art, the bulk of this book looks like this, and some of these things are created in photocopies. Mm -hmm. And he talks about that, you know, putting the, a piece on the machine and moving it as yep. the scanning is happening to create these kinds of, like, interesting visual effects and experimenting, and a lot of his work you know, shows that kind of uh, interest in experimentation and, and working with the tools that are available. You know, even putting together these pages is like a zine assembly, uh, which would often then be reproduced with a photocopier. So you get a little bit of that. You also get a little bit about how to steal some, some photocopies, uh, how to even lower the price more by, by maybe ripping these places off a little bit. All you, all you need is a clip-on tie. A suit from the Goodwill men and walk your happy <laughs> ass in with confidence to any uh, downtown skyscraper man. Walk up to their Xerox machine and just start using it. Yeah, he says uh, he opens this out with uh, free traces, scamming and stealing free photocopies. I have no money to publish. Maybe I'll just make an e-zine will never be an option again. <laughs> and so this is a step by step of how to get away with this. And then uh, this was something I just noticed when I revisited this this. Uh, zine for this episode is Aaron Comet Bus, the author, the creative force behind the Comet Bus zine, has a piece in here. This is like a four-page zine that's you know reduced down. So good luck reading this on screen. But talking about Xerox as art form, and again experimentation and things, you can see some of the stretched images. So not just reproducing your art, 
but also using the machine itself as a piece of technology, as a piece of art technology. One, one of the greatest examples in pop culture is the Misfits logo, where, where Glenn Danzig takes you know a page from Famous Monsters of Filmland with the Crimson Ghost, and then just does a high contrast. You know, there are settings on the Xerox machine. Increase the contrast, then you take out all the grays, man. You just have that stuff yes. black and white, and there it is. You could silkscreen that. For sure. And I wanted to uh, just bring up Aaron Comet Bus. I learned about Aaron Comet, Comet Bus from contributions on This American Life. So he's a great writer, and he's in the tradition of, like, blue-collar writers. Um, you know, Chuck Bukowski-type guys. There, there aren't a lot of these guys, but there were in the past. And they would kind of travel around the country almost like hobos, but writing. And, uh, and he continues this literary tradition. And as I said, I learned about it on This American Life whenever he would be a contributor and tell some story or other, often about riding Greyhound buses around the country. And this is a big collection of several of his zines. He interacts with comics and cartoonists and stuff, so I was surprised to see him in here because I didn't remember that. Mm -hmm. But probably I wasn't aware of his work whenever I made this zine. And then going through it now, it's like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. And, and it, Well, I know his work. I've never actually met him. Um, but, a, you know, kind of a comics-adjacent type person, and especially whenever it comes to producing your own media and being renowned for it. It's amazing the talent that is in this little oh, group. Oh yeah, it's it's it, and and I'm, we say the word generous, like but we never throw it around. Uh, this this is a very generous document. When Jordan Crane still like hosted it on the website, I must have sent dozens of people to that. And in fact, you sent me to it. Like when when I was unhappy with, um, I, I sent in paper. Like like I made Xeroxes for the publisher on my first Harvey P car stuff, and I hated the results. You were like, well, you need to take some control of that yourself, homeboy. And you sent me this PDF. So it became this this super viral. Uh, if I sent it to dozens of people, I'm sure they sent yeah, it to a couple people as well. This is like well. the, uh, the art school confidential of our generation of passing this around, except this was this was more of a how-to as, as opposed to criticizing the art schools. Um, this is Brian Ralph on silk screening. So Brian Ralph, again, when I learned about these guys, all is around this area. So I'm not sure what comes first. You know, Caven is was the first book I saw of Brian Ralph's. Uh, it was published by High Water Books, which, again, is close association with this and is called out a couple times in this publication. Is he a Fort Thunder guy? He was a Fort Thunder guy. And, you know, whenever High Water went away, the Fort Thunder guys kind of scattered. You know, some of them went to Picture Box. Uh, Brian Ralph, I think, went to Drawn and Quarterly. So I don't know if he's as closely associated with them, but he was part of that group, lived in Fort Thunder, all of that stuff, and... This is not silkscreen, this is offset printed, but you can see the influence of silkscreen in the way this is designed. One of the things High Water Books would do is print a lot of covers with one or two colors, which was very different at you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And this is kind of how you would make a silkscreen, you know, with a heavy, thicker line that would overprint on the undercolors. Uh, and so, you know, it's the same principle. And it translated to digital spot colors, which is, you know, what you're seeing here. And so... Another piece of this comic, besides being one of the early wordless, certainly the early wordless graphic novels that I encountered, is that the ink colors would change. That was something I hadn't seen before and something that's now in Plain Janes. So Brian Ralph also did a lot of mini comics and a lot of silk screening, which is why he's writing this article. Jordan Crane also did a ton of silk screening and, and I'm sure could have written a similar article. But early on, I would try silk screening. It was all from this. This mm. is exactly what I followed. You know, this is pre-YouTube or something where I could find a tutorial online. This was my tutorial, and it worked. I did several silk screens using what is described in this process uh, pretty successfully. Is that silk screen? It is. Yeah, shut that shit off. Yeah. So this is Jordan Crane's anthology non. I believe this is issue four. <laughs> Talk about a wild uh, project. So silkscreen covers that are then hand-assembled for this, this anthology. I think this is the last issue because of... <laughs> how, <laughs> what do you, you go can't from top there? this, DNA. you know? And I'm sure that once you do this, you're like, I can never do that again. I think you spent a long time assembling these things. I, I remember reading online where it was like, you know, it was just an ongoing project of putting these together because they're handmade, this, this, this box part, this outer, outer cover. And again, like the Brian Ralph book, it's almost like a spot color, yeah. you know, so like the silk screen, you would create a screen for each color and then you would print the ink from that screen. And then if it was another color, that was another screen and you would print that on top and you'd have to figure out like what, what 
order do you print those inks on? Yep. You know, if it's a light color, it goes in the background. If you're overprinting or if you have line art on top, you print that, you know, at the end. And so you can see certain graphic similarities with the spot colors and the uh, silk screen. This one you can mass produce, you know, thousands of. This one's each one by hand. It's a very technical process that Brian Ralph is describing here, though, and it's spread across several pages. Also, you can see how old this is. My staples are all rusted out. Damn, that just speaks to how old you are. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that there are the little the little visual like diagrams of how this is done and call outs for it. Like I said, it worked, man. I was able to do it, you know, just based on. I this. remember those silk screens that you put together, man. Some cool street angels. Very fun. And then finally, Jordan Crane's contribution. And this is the piece that I really come back to and continue to use today. And this was the reason why I would send those PDFs out. People were always asking, how do you scan? Like, like what's the proper resolution? Yeah, it's, it's really great. And uh, I guess there are some differences. You know, he talks about scanning here for line art. So line art would be like bitmap. That is hard black or white, uh, not grayscale, not anti-aliased edges. If you want to reproduce a black and white ink drawing like line art, this is the way to do it. And he says, scan your drawings at 800 DPI. Um, some people say that 600 is okay, but they're wrong. I actually scan at 600, and then I convert them to 1200 DPI and uh, as bitmaps, and I have pretty good success with that. But it's exactly the same principles that are outlined here. Oh, and look, he does have the convert it to 1200 DPI bitmap file. Yeah, I was about to say, like, he, you got an old version uh, that wasn't, but no, yeah, it's there. Yeah, I mean, literally, this is exactly what I still do 20 years later. Uh, and he goes through more complex stuff, like four color and spot color that we were talking about. Kind of relates to silk screen, but also definitely relates to that offset printing. If you want to do what looks like silk screen or get very specific colors, that would be a spot color where you can order like the exact ink. It's not mixed up by cyan, magenta, and yellow. It is the ink. Yeah, like a Pantone yes, color like a Pantone or something color, like that. Exactly. And on some kayfabe weeklies uh we were we were talking about um using like a 1200 dpi black line over top of like the 300 dpi yes. color line and, and i mean the color fills or whatever and this tells you how to do that yeah it does it's this is a it's an incredible document there's so much useful information in here it's so accurate um and jordan crane you know like he knows his stuff I think he's credited with a bunch of the artwork, uh, like preparation of artwork for the Jaime Hernandez uh, art book that came out several years ago. You know, there are, oh, there yeah, are some photos yeah, in there, there's some, some yeah, scanned yeah. images in there, some fun interviews with him. I used to read because he would do a lot of uh, screen printing himself, mm -hmm. and I would read interviews about that process and stuff, and you'd see him at shows like SPX with all these beautiful silk screen prints that he would make. Yeah, on hinges, like on like clothes lines. Yes, yeah. I remember that. Brian Ralph, too. It's like they were flanking the, the main ballroom or whatever. And here are a number of terms about actual production, uh, different what different terms mean to printers. So if you're ordering a book and you're trying to, you know, spec how you want it produced and what kind of materials you want it, want it used for it, um, things like perfect bind, saddle stitching, you know, these are different types of binding. This book is saddle stitched, mm -hmm. which is to say it's, it's stapled through the middle. You know, the book's folded in half and done. This is my favorite part, and this is what, where I always go to whenever somebody comes up to yes. me at comic conventions asking me about, how do I trademark my stuff before I show it to anybody, thinking that they're presenting me with the next Mickey Mouse? <laughs> uh, as far as the copyright worries go, fuck it. <laughs> this is funny, too. When speaking about printing, use of the word over can get you instant credibility. <laughs> 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 and some, some words on book design. So... Again, very closely associated with uh, high water books, which at the time, like I started collecting high water books because they were designed better than everything else. You know, we've talked a lot about the evolution of graphic design in comics and, and uh, graphic novels. High water books was really at the front edge of that in, in a lot of ways. There were a couple other publishers that were, you know, moving in a positive direction, but in my mind, high water books was sort of like this this turning point in terms of comics production because they started making books that looked great. And that meant everybody else needed to up their game. Right. Um, and then some contact information uh, on printing and, and additional resources and things like that. Even distrib distributors list. And I bet you most of those, well... I think they're all there. I think Cold Cut's gone. That used to be a small press distributor, I think, for a long time. Uh, 
So I guess maybe a hundred percent of this 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 information isn't still accurate, but man, most of it is. Oh yeah. yeah what yeah. a piece. So I have thanked people uh, in the past for some of the work that they have made. Uh, I can't thank Jordan Crane enough for putting this together because I don't know how I would have learned this stuff otherwise. Yeah, yeah, and it became sage-like advice, man. I I uh, definitely thanked him. Uh, you know, I never really spoke to him in person, but just online, I I sent kudos and shit to him. I definitely have pointed so many people to this uh, document. Um, it's not like I guess the site isn't available anymore, but it is available through the Wayback Machine. So if we don't put a link in uh, the description, a K Faber will man, and we'll pin it to the top of the comments. But you check out this repro guide. You now have no excuse when it comes to the um, production of your stuff. We don't want to see any more pixelation. <laughs> That's all I have, Ed. Well, let's go make some comics, dude. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll let you know when our next videos are available. Make sure you do so because we are on the race to 15,000 subscribers. You can pick up Cartoonist K Fabe merchandise and t shirts at the links below the video. Be sure to subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below the video. I'm going to go search for this PDF again, man. Give them the marching orders, dude. Make more comics.